I'm joined with Troy Beaujolais from Atha Energy. Troy, it's nice to do this in person. Absolutely, great to be with you. So, uh, Troy, let's start off with the price of uranium. Uh, since the last time we talked, the price has come down a little bit, uh, but I gotta say, here we are at the Red Cloud event. Everybody I talk to that works in uranium seems pretty happy. Yeah. What's your read on the uranium market right now? It, it is as strong as it's ever been. Uh, in my opinion, you know, despite, you know, uranium coming off, like, like you say, from 105, call it, uh, down to 83, 84 bucks, what it is right now, that's in this thinly traded spot market. Uh, the thing to really pay attention to is the macro sentiment that is growing in, in an extremely bullish way. Uh, the demand stack is increasing. Um, we've seen, you know, recent news out of some of the major tech giants in the U.S. Uh, that are backing nuclear in a real way, in a tangible way. Um, we're seeing, you know, we're we're at the early stages of a long-term contracting cycle, which we haven't yet, you know, entered into. So everything, you know, from a macro perspective, is trending on, if not above, where we had hoped. You mentioned tech giants getting into uranium. Uh, it was just announced that Amazon's now working with Dominion Energy to help fund SMRs. Similar announcements coming from uh, both Microsoft and Google. And I'm curious here, you've been working in uranium for decades now. How much has the sentiment changed here? If, if, if you were uh, in Silicon Valley and you mentioned nuclear, I, I don't know if you spent any time in Silicon Valley, but in, in, in areas that might be a little bit more uh, urban, uh, and you mentioned nuclear power 10 years ago. I feel like there would have been some people who would have given you a little bit of pushback. It feels like we're kind of past that point now. Yeah, I, I, think, I think the tide has turned completely. You know, you're absolutely right that a decade ago, um, nuclear was a small subset of, of the market. People, you know, ha had opinions strongly one way or the other. Uh, that opinion has shifted significantly, and, and it's through the realization um, that nuclear energy is, a, you know, one of the greenest, is not the greenest form of energy. There is zero carbon emitting energy um, in a world that is transitioning into a net zero energy environment, and you know, needs a solution to get there. And the solution to get there is nuclear. And so I think there's been a broader realization of that. And then, you know, you couple that then with the, the build out in the tech space uh, as it relates to data centers and you know the, uh, what, what could become exponential growth on that side and then needing to solve for the energy requirements to support that build out and now they're pointing to nuclear. And, and you know that, that is incredibly bullish for the space uh, but that's in addition to you know, a, a macro environment, a supply demand environment in the nuclear space that's been building for a decade. And that really starts with civil reactor build out in Asia. And then you couple that with what was demand destruction in the US market and in the Western European market that is now curtailed and now you're seeing demand increase. And so you've got a coupling of strong demand in the Asian market, uh, demand stacking in the North American market with civil nuclear scale build outs. And then anything from an SMR perspective and a micro reactor perspective is just torque on top of that. So it, it's, it's, a, it's an extremely positive position that we find ourselves in right now. Something we talk about quite a bit, uh, Jay and I, when, when, when we're trying to analyze the uranium market is this idea that, say, somebody like um, NextGen and that Rook deposit that you uh, famously were involved with, the impact that it could have on the overall supply and demand characteristics of the uranium market should it go online. I mean, the numbers that they're talking about in terms of annual production are like the size of Kaz Adam prom. Uh, should this concern us as if, if we're uranium bulls, just one project coming online that can chew up so much of demand? No, I'm, uh, not at all. And, and the reason for that, it's already factored in. Okay, you, you look at Rook One. It, uh, it's not an if project, it, it's a when project. Rook One will come online. Um, it's a fantastic asset um, and the world needs it. The world needs that supply to come online. And even with that supply coming online, there's still a deficit. Okay, so we, we've, we've came through a market where uh, conventionally any, the risk side on a supply demand perspective has predominantly been on the demand side. Mm -hmm. Okay, risk of demand destruction, et cetera. Now we've switched over, we, we, we passed an inflection point where the risk on the supply demand side is squarely on the supply. 
Okay, so the risk of supply disruptions. You look at the concentration of supply amongst major producers uh, and major assets globally, and any supply side risk there um, is a material risk to the overall industry. And so the, the, the supply side, the, the risk has transformed and has shifted onto the supply side. Not only do we need more than Rook 1, we need multiple Rook 1s to come online uh, through the 2040 decade to, to satisfy the supply demand profile. Because right now we're in a structural supply deficit. So at what point does the structural supply deficit really start to knock prices loose? Like, and, 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 and I'm saying that, I understand it's a little bit ridiculous because the price recently went from $30 yeah. to over 100. Uh, could we see more of that? I, I think so. I think the asymmetry is very squarely to the upside on the uranium price. And the, the actual catalyst to pay attention to, in my opinion, in the near term, is actually the contracting cycle. Okay, so you look at the amount of contract or contracting that becomes uncovered between now and the end of the decade. It's very similar to the amount of contracting that was uncovered in the 2006 through 2010 timeframe. And we all, you know, those of us that have been in the uranium space for a while, all clearly understand the impact that that contracting cycle had during the 20. Or 2007 time horizon, where the price of uranium went from say $35 a pound up to $135 a pound, and you know that run up in the uranium price was predominantly a function of that contracting cycle and long-term contracting contracting occurring in the uranium space, and we have not yet entered into that. We are about to enter into that period. Okay, so let's talk about Atha Energy. Uh, you guys recently announced that you've completed your exploration program at the Angelac pro project in Nunavut. What can you tell us? We're, we're thrilled with the results. Um, you know, the, the, the intention of the program uh, this summer at Angulac was widely space drilling to expand the footprint of known mineralization there. You know, backing up, just, you know, giving people a snapshot of what Angulac is. Angulac contains a LAC 50 deposit at 43 million pounds at 0.69% U308, one of the highest grade deposits outside of the Athabasca Basin. And our critical path there is scale. Okay, and so as a function of that, we designed a uh, 10,000 meter, 25 drill hole program uh, where every drill hole, every meter of drilling was focused on expansion, expanding uh, the envelope of known mineralization, and not only that, but expand expanding into new parallel corridors uh, where our future resource growth will go through. So every one of the drill holes achieved the result we wanted it to achieve. We significantly and materially expanded the footprint of mineralization at Angulac, which then in turn um, de-risked that next phase for us, which was material resource growth. So what does future exploration look like uh, when it I guess that's dependent on the results. Yeah, yeah. So we have assays pending. Uh, we expect assays, um, you know, within kind of call it a four-week time horizon here uh, to come back from the SRC lab in Saskatoon. Uh, from there, we'll design the next phase of the program. But based off where we where we sit right now, next phases will be into resource expansion, resource growth as a function of uh, defining that broader mineralized envelope um, that we already defined through the work that we did this year. Okay, outside of Nunavut, you guys also have some exploration programs in the Athabasca Basin. What can you tell us there? Yeah, we, we have uh, Atha as a profile, okay? We've, we've got around eight and a half million acres of exploration property um, across the Athabasca Basin, the Thelon Basin, the Central Mineral Belt in Labrador. Um, and what we've been doing over the last 12 to 14 months has been maturing that land position significantly, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, we, we've done more geophysics than I think any other company out there intentionally though, and the intention of that geophysics is to be able to define the highest probability, highest priority targets from the largest land position in what is often considered the best uranium jurisdictions in the world. And so from that perspective, we're set up very well. We're at the stage now of being able to rank, order, prioritize those exploration targets on those properties. But in addition to that, we also have the Gemini property. And the Gemini property is the reason that we acquired 92 Energy. That's a recent discovery on the edge of the Ath eastern edge of the Athabasca Basin. Uh, we're currently undertaking a drill program right now, which is focused on additional discovery along what is a fertile corridor on the eastern edge of the Athabasca Basin. When I think about geophysics in the Athabasca Basin, for example, uh, and you're talking about properties of this scale, you probably could, like, do you have to own the land to do geophysics over it? Uh, as a best practice, yeah. Okay. okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. And if you're investing the dollars, yeah. uh, if you're investing the dollars, you want to ensure access to mineral tenure. Okay, but but 
you guys have an idea of what those geophysics look like in some of the other big deposits that have been found in the Athabasca Basin, right? Like, mm -hmm. like, like, are you guys able to find those similar sort of characteristics that you would see? Yeah, that, that's exactly what we're looking for, okay? And that's how we decide, uh, de design the surveys, and that's how we execute the surveys. What we're looking for is stacked geophysical anomalies. Okay, so you look for, you know, conventional in the Athabasca Basin, you're looking for uh, a magnetic low, yeah. okay, a linear magnetic low, you're looking for an EM conductor, you're looking for a gravity low, which is a signature of the alteration around these uranium deposits. And more recently, we've also deployed ANT or ambient noise tomography, which is um, another survey that it's designed to give you a high degree of resolution on the alteration, alteration signature around these deposits. So you're looking for stacked anomalies as opposed to a single anomaly. Um, and then in situations where possible, you're also looking for geochemistry that overlays on top of that as a further de-risking approach to your targeting. Okay, now have you found any of those that have you super excited that that, yeah. that, that maybe gave you a night you couldn't sleep after you found it? Sure, we, we've got a number of targets. You know, as you can imagine, with over 4.8 million acres of exploration property in the Athabasca Basin, uh, doing it, the amount of geophysics that we've done, uh, we have a large pipeline of targets that's been built up that we consider high probability. And to be considered high probability for us, um, it has to fall into that category. It has to be a multiple, uh, you know, a stacked anomaly across multiple surveys. Uh, we like the North Shore area. Uh, we like the area in Passfield, um, you know, we like Gemini, we like a number of our project areas. Okay, you guys have optioned out a few land packages, yeah. or a, a couple, I, I think a two off the top of my head. Um, uh, any updates there? Yeah, so about $30 million in, in, uh, in earn-in agreements that we've executed so far. Uh, the whole rationale there is, you know, we, we ranked, ordered, prioritized our exploration properties. Those properties that say fall within the two to three year time frame within our exploration window, um, we're looking at pulling the value in those properties forward through farm out agreements. Really what it's doing is maximizing the opportunity for discovery within a single portfolio uh, by maximizing the amount of work that's getting done on the ground um, and, you know, the discovery potential within that work. Okay, if I'm uh, an investor watching the story uh, or I have you guys on my watch list, what am I looking out for over the next year? O over, the, over the past 12 months, we have executed an aggressive growth strategy. We've completely transformed the profile of the company. Uh, that's through both the work that we've done on the ground um, and through the acquisitions that we've made. You know, based off where we're at uh, within the macro environment within this uranium cycle, expect us to continue to be very aggressive. Uh, we, we will aggressively explore and advance the projects that we have within our current portfolio, and we look for aggressive growth opportunities. So we're going to continue to execute on that mandate. Okay. Well, Troy, uh, thanks for hopping on here. It's always a pleasure uh, when we get to speak. And uh, as some of these drill results com come in and you guys continue to execute on your strategy, please keep coming back on here and chatting with us. Yeah, we will do. Thank you very much. Thanks, Appreciate Troy. it.